client said, well, I don't know enough about you. I, I don't want to write a check. Uh, they talked a little further, and the lawyer mentioned that he was a regular legal analyst on the Voice of America Creole service. And the, uh, the man said, well, now I'm glad to give you a check, because now I know uh, that uh, if BOA interviews you, you're credible. You're credible with me. Another story from our Persian service also today, because I was asking for our story for this talk. Uh, apparently, a prominent environmentalist that they uh, recently interviewed, uh, who lives in Iran, uh, told them of being in a remote area in southern Iran, looking at a river that had environmental issues. And he's standing there on the rocks, you know, and a villager comes up on a donkey up the path. And the villager looks at him and says, you're Mr. K. Rob, aren't you? I've seen you on VOA TV. <laughs> and one more quick one. When I, let, when I uh, met with the president of Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, uh, Thin Sein, uh, who had just uh, decided to allow VOA onto Burmese state radio to teach English, and to allow his friends who own Skynet t uh, Dish TV in Burma to put our news on the air, the president said to me, it's nice to meet the director of the Voice of America. I learned my English from Voice of America. So there are thousands of stories like this. My point being, VOA has impact, real impact. And for Voice of America, this is a time of extraordinary growth in audience. Officially, the number right now is, a, is 164 million. But, uh, and it was 134 million when I, when I took office. Uh, just a, almost well, about three years ago. But frankly, that number is going to need to be updated soon. It's out of date already. Tens of millions have been added to it since, since we said 164 in the middle of last year. So we'll have a new number soon. Now, you might ask, why is our impact growing now? Those of you who follow Voice of America and the story of international broadcasting know that uh, there are budget cuts and there are public debates about the future of VOA. Well, the, the, main, the main reason we're having audience growth, we have such dramatic audience growth at the moment, the main reasons are basically two, and I'm going to talk about them now. But there is one other reason, and I'll come back to it at the end, and that is because back <coughs> in the 1970s, in Congress, legislators got it right when they created the VOA Charter. I'll come back to that in a minute, but let me start with the two major developments. The first is an extraordinary growth of audience reach uh, that we've been building over the last three, four, five years by working much more closely with our broadcasting partners around the world, our affiliates. More than half of VOA's measured audience now uh, uh, comes to us by affiliated stations and networks. Uh, these are largely terrestrial television and FM radio stations and networks. For example, with a weekly audience of uh, share of 33 million people, or 19% of the adult population, VOA Indonesia broadcasts via hundreds of affiliates, including eight of the 11 national television stations, more than 30 regional and local TV stations, and more than 400 FM radio affiliates throughout Indonesia. In Ukraine, where, the, where VOA more than doubled its audience within weeks of the Russian invasion of Crimea. We now have an 18% share, that's about 7 million people that we reach every day in two languages in Ukraine, Ukrainian and Russian. With uh, thanks to financial help from uh, Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy Richard Stengel and his team, he of course represents Secretary Kerry on our board, VOA has added several new affiliates and a television newscast in Russian that, uh, that is aired by Ukrainian service. It's about Ukrainian news, Ukrainian, U.S., and national news. But it's aimed at the stations in the east of Ukraine. And as we all know, that's where the news is going on right now. And it's such an important new market that we want to reach as well as possible. <laughs> Another example, Pakistan. When I arrived, uh, VOA had one broadcast. Uh, uh, television broadcast on in Urdu in Pakistan. We concluded we could do better. And working with the gentleman who's in the room here and others, uh, we rebuilt our, our, our Pakistan television strategy, uh, put several new shows on the air, several new products. We have several new affiliates. We quintupled our audience in Pakistan. When the national security stakes are high enough, 
we are ready to accept calculated risks to get into markets and to reach people. Give me an example. Right now. And there's blogs about this and controversy about this. Fair enough. We have a new <coughs> production with something called the Russian Business Channel called Cold War Question Mark. I didn't pick the title, they did. Um, I don't know whether President Putin is long going to allow this to continue, but he is at the moment. We've had two broadcasts on so far in the last two weeks. Um, two weekly shows which reach 11% of the Russian television audience. And this audience has watched while Russian and American journalists and commentators debate Ukraine and other topics over which they differ. And it's true. I mean, while the Russian anchor uses all the advantages, he's got the microphone. His, the engineers work for him. It's his show. It's his audience. And of course, uh, uh, President Putin and his policies are popular in Russia. So there are many advantages for the RBC side of the argument, if you will. But nonetheless, this audience is now uh, hearing something new, both sides. Um, we had, for example, uh, a, here's a quote from the first show. This was Erika Marat of Johns Hopkins University in Russia. She said, quote, I think this is a turning point for Putin because finally the West and the international community are calling a spade a spade. This is a full-scale war between two countries, the Russian military are fighting against the military of Ukraine. Well, those of you who follow this story, this issue know that, that is not what the Russian, what the Kremlin says. They say they have no troops in Ukraine. But our <coughs> guests, having seen uh, the information that's available in the West and not so much in Russia, no otherwise. We're also working with our sister, net sister network, RFERL, the Radio Free Europe company, is now based in Prague, on a new 30-minute television show in Russia. We're hoping it'll start next month. Again, we're doing this with help from our friends at State, and they're giving us some startup money, for which we're very grateful. And we're hoping and we believe that we will have affiliates for this show in places like Moldova, Latvia, Ukraine, where there are substantial Russian-speaking minorities that are not right now being well served by anything other than Kremlin television. We're hoping they will pick it up as an antidote to that. Now, much of the growth of VOA's audience, and it has been, as I've said, quite, quite dramatic, is based around something we call the U.S. Bureau concept. Our reporters file branded reports VOA reports from locations in the United States or around the world, and they file them directly into the newscasts of our high-value partners. VOA explains U.S. policies and society as well as world events in formats that appeal both to our partners and to their audiences. In Latin America alone, this has led us uh, to growth uh, along these lines. When I arrived, at, and I don't take all the credit for this, it was planned before I got there, but we're implementing it We've improved it, I think, in, during my tenure. Uh, when I arrived, our audience in Latin America writ large was somewhere in the region of three to four, four and a half million viewers and listeners. Now it's well over 26 million. And here's a quick uh, promo tape to show you the Latin America division's take on what it's doing. We're a media company, right? So I have to run videos. <laughs> Más allá de la... 
simple censura es el tener la información de primera mano y poderla transmitir tal cual eh, está ocurriendo. La capacidad de cobertura. Esto me permitió dar una visión mucho más amplia y hemos tenido ese tipo de validades, ¿no? Se, se han crecido. Con la colaboración de la Voz de América hemos tenido amplias coberturas en el momento mismo que ocurre la noticia, transmisiones en vivo. El apoyo que nos brindan ustedes no se limita solamente a un formato, sino que además tiene posibilidades multimedia eh, eh, y que eso también enriquece mucho la calidad de información que nosotros le hacemos llegar. Nos cuesta tener eh, desarrollos tecnológicos, eh, algún tipo de eso, porque nuestro país es un poco más lento que, eh, que los Estados Unidos. Sería bastante complicado desde el punto de vista presupuestario poder tener a un periodista destacado en Washington. Para nosotros ha sido de especial apoyo a lo que son situaciones de crisis, acontecimientos sumamente importantes como las elecciones en los Estados Unidos, el atentado de la Maratón de Boston. El contacto de todos los días que hacemos con Gonzalo Abarca. Podríamos tener un candidato vicepresidencial hispano. Estamos creciendo gracias a La Voz de América. Nuestro canal ha logrado tener la altura de cualquiera de los canales a nivel internacional. La cobertura ha hecho que tiene impacto en la opinión pública nacional. Tener una fuente de primera mano que, que sea veraz eh, y con mucho profesionalismo, como es la Voy América, para nosotros es una ayuda invalorable. That's the Latin Americans. Some of the most exciting uh, potential for growth that we see looking forward is actually in our own language, English. For instance, as, as of a couple of months ago, VOA English now reaches more than 30 million people daily through Nigeria's Channels TV, with which we've just signed a new partnership. And by the way, that wasn't included in the 164 million. So you can start counting if you want. Um, our reporters do live shots for Channels TV and reports every day on everything from the Ebola breakout to the African League <coughs> Summit with President Obama over this summer, to the growing pains of the Communist Party-led growth strategy of China. Uh, working with uh, affiliate partners in Africa and elsewhere also has uh, other benefits. Uh, with help and funding from our partners in the IBB, and also sometimes from the State Department, uh, we train hundreds of journalists uh, from our affiliate partners and from other media operators in our target markets every year. We have programs, or have had recently programs, in South Sudan, Nigeria, Burundi, Bangladesh, and Haiti, for example. Uh, and we also bring journalists uh, to VOA for fellowships and internships. We have some right now from both Indonesia and from Ukraine in the building. So in sum, I see extraordinary potential for further growth uh, in audience reach through affiliate relationships. But the other major new factor, I mentioned that there were two, the other major factor that uh, is strongly contributing to DOA's impact, and I think maybe even more significant in the long run, is on my belt here. This thing. How many of you don't have one? Um, and it, in a recent survey of 24 countries, uh, in 20 countries, 75% of those responded said they have a mobile telephone or device. Some of these countries were very poor. I mean, Afghanistan, where I served uh, as, as a diplomat, the, I can tell you, the goat herds would rather go hungry than not pay the $2 a month and have a cell phone on their belt. Uh, everybody's gone. So it is uh, an extraordinary, and they're skipping the landline, as are so many of these countries. So it is an extraordinary way to reach people. Um, uh, as I speak, 36% of all visits to VOA websites now use a mobile device to log on. In some of our services, the mobile device has already surpassed the desktop. And over time, we expect it will do so in every single language. So working with the IBB, and I'll explain what that is to those of you who don't know in a minute, if you like, um, but working with them, our partners within the US International Media <coughs> Broadcasting under the BBG, we now have mobile apps for almost all of our language services. I just want to show you one more video about that.
VOA is currently one of the top 125 uh, mobile web sites in the world. We, are, we have more, more reach, more people coming to us than Politico.com, TheGuardian.com, TheWashingtonTimes.com, so we um, and, and many, many others. Um, our largest mobile website in terms of reach is Hausa, the language of northern Nigeria and some of the other countries there. Um, we average a, a 4 million monthly visits in Hausa on mobile apps. Uh, Hausa, the VOA Hausa has created a special mobile stream called Dandalin, and we now have journalists, a couple of them, who work only for that. So we now have journalists who work for the mobile phone. They're not doing radio, television, they're doing the mobile phone. Um, and uh, so in northern Nigeria, our journalism is received on phones, even in areas that are under enormous stress right now from Boko Haram, and uh, that the, the information about the Boko Haram threats, and specifically where they are and how to get away from them, is obviously a, 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 a constant up, update uh, that we provide on that service. So make mo no mistake, the, the mobile phone is a very big part of our future. But we also keep trying to look for creative ways to reach what, what we call the business denied areas. And, um, even as affiliates and mobile phones help us to reach much of the world, we put, uh, really, I would say, a massive amount of our budget and our resources and our people against that challenge. Uh, these are places where the governments want to keep their people ignorant by denying them access to international broadcasts or by censoring the internet. So here we use direct satellite TV or good old shortwave radio or other forms of cross-border radio uh, and digital technology of various kinds. And this is absolutely vital and is still and will remain a key part of what we do at Voice of America. But for example, reaching the Iranian public, clearly a top national security priority for the United States. We have a 24 share in Iran. By that I mean almost a quarter of the entire country watches at least one VOA television show a week. That's reach. That's impact. And that's despite the fact that our sa the satellite dishes that are used to pick us up are illegal. So all those people are breaking the law in Iran. And oh, by the way, I'll just mention it. I can't help it. We have a bigger audience than our rivals in TBC in Iran. It may not always be that way because we're close, but we're ahead right now, so I might as well brag. Um, then there's China, the biggest market we aim at and one of the toughest. The Chinese government heavily censors media. VOA Mandarin broadcasts two hours a day of daily original television news via VOA Weishu, or satellite TV, and six hours of original radio news programs via shortwave. The programs include uh, live participation from people all over China with call-ins and email questions. Uh, we send out a daily news email with proxy information to more than 10 million recipients in China each day. And we provide a 24-7 audio stream with proxies and news tickers to try to help people find ways to get around the Great Firewall. VOA Tibetan broadcasts three hours of television news a week and six hours of shortwave radio. VOA Cantonese also targets southern Chinese with two hours of radio and a weekly TV show about America that's broadcast in prime time on Hong Kong's Asia TV channel. Chinese uh, programs, VOA Chinese programs, are viewed or heard on demand on mobile devices with mobile apps that we're updating with anti-censorship tools to try to break through the firewall. And when you look at the visits to our VOA Chinese website um, that are referred from other websites, 80% of them come through web portals that circumvent the Beijing firewall. Many of those portals are provided by our colleagues at the IBB, but uh, there are others as well. In any case, there's quite an active, act, there's a lot of activity in China. A lot of people are trying to hear and see us one way or another, and they're finding ways. Millions of people, I wouldn't say hundreds of millions, but millions. Now, a word about underdeveloped areas. We also keep our strong shortwave radio efforts where they continue to have real impact. And in some cases, places that are underdeveloped, like Somalia. Every other Somalian listens to 
Voice of America every week, half the country. Or Ethiopia, where severely restricted media environment, and actually, frankly, I think the government, <coughs> by so restricting the environment, helps VOA. We have six million people that we reach every week there. And the leadership of that effort, until very, very recently, is in the room also. We've got some very distinguished VOA people in the room here, and I'm so proud to be with them. So all over the world, we work closely with our colleagues uh, at the Department of State to maximize our effectiveness where it matters most to American foreign policy. One more example, um, we have very close ties with the Africa, uh, with the folks who do Africa at the State Department. They, it is a third of our audience, and probably where much of the growth potential uh, to, in the future resides. We are, in fact, doing some enhancements, even in a tight budget environment, to our budget for Africa. And uh, recently, with the help of folks from the IBB, we've gotten some transmitters and um, uh, towers that are literally sitting on the roofs of embassies in African countries. So if there's trouble in the streets, it's at least more likely that the Marine Guards will be able to keep our, our, our signal on the air. I began by speaking about two major new drivers of our growth and impact. Uh, and I also mentioned the VOA Charter. Let me come back to that now, because uh, these new ways of distributing content, they only work because they're built on strong foundations. I mean, first of all, Voice of America. What a brand name. You couldn't ask for a better brand name. And it's also great to be America's official international state broadcaster. People say they'd like to privatize us. Well, you know, I'm open to the idea. I'm happy to discuss it. But let me just tell you that being a state broadcaster has its advantages. I think many Americans, probably not those in the room, because most of you have traveled for a living uh, at one time or another, but many Americans don't understand the power of being a state broadcaster because we don't have one here. Not a real state broadcaster. Not in the United States. But other people do, and they understand what that means. Frankly, the prestige of being the state broadcaster of the United States opens doors for us. So in Mali, for example, when I went to visit, the information minister said, we have a spare FM transmitter on the hill. It's actually got the best signal in town. Would you like it? <laughs> yes, we would. Yes, we would. Or uh, we, when I went to Myanmar, as I mentioned, uh, and, and, the, and President Sinsane Sin allowed us to start broadcasting our English learning programs on state radio. But the, uh, and there's so many more examples where the doors are open because we are the United States Broadcasting, international broadcasting. But the most important foundation, without which we could not be building audience, as we are now at VOA, is the charter. Passed by Congress in 1976, signed into law by President Ford, it mandates that our journalists be objective, balanced, comprehensive, that we explain U.S. foreign policy and present varying, responsible views on it. It is our mission statement. It's the foundation upon which we build. And the fact that because that charter requires us to do so, the fact that we report about America, warts and all, as Oliver Cromwell used to say, Abu Ghraib, Watergate, I'm jumping around here in time, backwards, Watergate, Abu Ghraib, Edward Snowden and the NSA, Ferguson, Missouri, you name it. We cover it, and we cover it honestly. And that gives us credibility, which is the coin of the realm of broadcasting, as any broadcaster will tell you. Credibility. If you don't have it, you don't have an audience. So for the price of about two F-35s, approximately, $200 million, VOA reaches Officially, 164 million. We'll have a new number soon. It'll be pretty close to a dollar per person, I think, before long. VOA builds understanding of our country, its people, its values. It's a respected <coughs> international news organization, and it is a valuable national security asset for the United States of America. As one of our governors likes to say, we export the First Amendment. And he's right, we do. So with more affiliates, with the mobile phone surging, with a continued determined effort to reach people living under repressive regimes, I believe that the company that I have the honor to lead right now 
uh, will have continued growth in its audience. And I also believe that, quite frankly, if VOA didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. I am the custodian of the microphone, but you may choose the uh, you may choose the uh, the question. Ah. Liz. Uh, Liz Colton, thank you so much, David. That was a very good uh, overview of everything and exciting. But what is the status of the funding? What's the situation with Congress of continued funding for the Voice of America? Well, it's uncertain. <coughs> right? I mean, anyone who reads the papers knows that, or reads websites. Um, and that's a challenge for us that we have to work on. I mean, I, 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 I'm sort of asking for your help. Uh, not too many Americans seem to understand, and, you know, it's, uh, it's understandable that they don't. Until recent years, uh, we were not permitted even to supply one of our programs to an American broadcaster. smith munt Act. I think understandably at the time, the 50s or whatever it was that they passed it, uh, you know, said, you're, you're not, we don't want a big brother in this country. You're an, ex you're an export uh, company. No, no, no broadcasting here. But you know, the internet made a fool of that. All of our websites, you can look at them here in any language, and everything's global now. And the Congress, I think very wisely last year, amended that. We're now reaching, I have I have a list in my car I didn't bring with me, but we're now reaching scores of radio stations all over America in, in Khmer or Somali or Spanish with some of our products, that, with our programs that they want to play. Um, I'm going down tomorrow to Florida and North Carolina to talk to, to American diaspora groups, to Haitians and others. Um, because the Creole speaking community is global now. They're not just in Haiti. And a lot of them are here. So. Part of what we're trying to do now is to, is to build support in this country for this wonderful national treasure the whole Voice of America. And because we weren't on the air here and we're sort of out of sight, out of mind, I think particularly since the Cold War ended, a lot of people kind of thought about, hey, what? because when I introduced myself as you know, director of VOA, they said, really, does that still exist? You know, <laughs> That's interesting. I thought that went away with the Cold War. And no, it didn't, and the audience is bigger now. Um, and, and if you look at the world that we're living in right now, I mean, does anyone question the need for us to be talking, be conversing, to be uh, broadcasting reliable news to places that don't have it? I, I mean, I think it's beyond, to me, beyond question. And very, very important work. So yes, uh, the budgets are challenged, as are most federal budgets, but ours certainly is. We've had cuts in every year that I've been director. Uh, some of them won sound worse and then they're less bad in the end when, when you get through the whole budget system, but still, we're doing more with less. Uh, there's legislation of various kinds. Um, as Don said, I can't really, can't really comment on specific legislation. I can just tell you what VOA does now, which laws it does it under, and why I think it's so important that it continue to do so. And ask for your help to convince other people. This is money well spent, please. Bruce Gregory, George Washington University. Um, you said you can't comment on the pending legislation, fair enough. But a few weeks ago, BBG webcast a Q&A with Ben Rowe on the legislation where he expressed some yes. views on it. Could you perhaps summarize what he had to say and the extent of your opinion? Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, Ben Rhodes, uh, who I used to work with when I was in Kabul, was on weird hours of the night in Kabul on the, on the satellite hookup with him many times. Um, came, had, took some time to talk to the, to the Broadcasting Board of Governors and talked about this legislation. Uh, without summarizing everything he said, um, one thing he said that, uh, that struck me is the administration does not like the proposal in the bill, and this is him talking, not me, uh, that, would, that would break up the grantees, that's Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, and the Middle East Broadcasting Network, separate them out from under the BBG, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, to which we all now report create their own board with members appointed by Congress, not the executive branch, and give them their own their own CEO. And the legislation, by the way, also gives us a CEO. Um, so Ben Rhodes said he didn't favor that. The administration doesn't like that idea. and thinks it would, would not be helpful. 
But beyond that, um, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, you've seen what he said. <coughs> Anyone else got a David? Former director. Uh, here, you, here you are. <laughs> the relationship between VOA and the State Department has always been sort of a awkward one um, from the perspective of both agencies for various reasons. Uh, I know when I was at VOA, um, I, I was always frustrated that we didn't have an easier time getting people from the State Department to be on our shows to explain U.S. policy, to, to um, give the you know, government's point of view on stories where we needed that balance. How, how's the relationship these days? So is there any better cooperation? Is it still sort of a prickly relationship? Well, they have their job to do, we have ours, and they're different. They overlap, but they're different. Um, I, I would say that with the arrival on the board of two very, uh, very uh, distinguished Americans, uh, <coughs> Ambassador Ryan Crocker and uh, Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy Richard Stengel, who's a former managing editor of Time Magazine, one of us journos, um, we've got a couple of people who are going to work hard to uh, mend whatever tears there are in the relationship between uh, international broadcasting and, and uh, the State Department, particularly VOA and the State Department. Um, you know, we are going to do separate jobs. Uh, it, but, but I think particularly, I mean, there are just a lot of places in the world where embassies, at the embassy level, have a very, very clear sense of how strong um, a public diplomacy tool Voice of America is for, for them, and how important it is when they want to reach audiences in the country that they are serving, that they are serving in for the United States. So uh, Africa in particular, they, they totally get it. We are very big in Africa. It's hard to avoid us. Uh, but many other places too. I think uh, we've, you know, there, there's been some certain amount of controversy about our Persian service over the years, but, you know, 24% kind of and it tells you that we're, we're reaching quite a few people in Iran. We reach more people in Iran than any other Western broadcaster. Probably more people in Iran than any other Western effort to reach Iranians of any kind. So if you want to talk to the Iranian people, come to us. And under Secretary, uh, uh, Wendy Sherman, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, called us on, at one point on pretty short notice because they had something they wanted to say quickly to a large number of Iranians. We're the way to do that, and they know it. So I would say we're building. It's a constant effort. I mean, it's a garden that needs tending. And actually, there's a gentleman who does that uh, in the back of the room, Dan Sreevi. Thank you for coming, Dan. Um, and Dan is in the undersecretary's office and keeps, keeps an eye on us for, for him and also tries to build, build relationships. And we really need to work harder at it, frankly. Um, I used to be a journalist, but now I'm an, a public official. And I and other senior officials of VOA need to be working to get to build relationships and, you know, common interests with people at the State Department who have particular foreign policy goals. In some cases, they may coincide with what we ought to be reporting about. So, but you're right, it's, it has its prickly sides. And frankly, I think part of that is the editorials. Um, and we can get into that if people want to talk about it, but it's a whole big subject. So I'll stop there. <laughs> As the numbers are continuing to go up, um, do you know, do you have any information on what the trends are among those new um, viewers, listeners? Do they trend younger, older, urban, rural, across the spectrum? Any demographic information on, on who those people are? Well, because the vast majority of our new listeners and viewers and readers uh, are coming to us through affiliates, and most of those are commercial broadcasters, um, it's a pretty varied group, tending young and tending female, which is exactly where we want to be, frankly, because we're because our audience historically has been too male and too old. Um, so we want to get more young people, and we want to get more women uh, taking an interest in what we're having to offer. <coughs> so we're very, very pleased with it. Let me stress also, lest anyone think that I think the whole answer is affiliates. I do not. I mean, I, it's not the answer in China and Iran. I can tell you that. Um, and, and we are looking for creative ways and we're constantly uh, fine-tuning our efforts to reach more people in those, those hard-to-reach countries where affiliates are not an option. 
Um, but the demographics of, I like the demographics of our growth. For the most part, they are broadening our audience, which, which could use some of that. Sir, please. Uh, I'm Tom Chuck. Um, this is really not a question to you, but it is, since this is an AFSA platform, it's a comment and a question. As long as I was in the Foreign Service and going back to the 1950s in Moscow, I've always considered EOA as probably the most important public diplomacy medium that the State Department had at its disposal. And this continued throughout my 35 years in the Foreign Service. And my relationship USIA, State Department, USIA, has always been a very close one. And many of my State Department colleagues agree with me, feeling that the voice of America is an important element in our public diplomacy function. My question is, does the State Department now take an active interest in dealing with the Congress in regard to the new legislation, which in effect is enacted as it is now by the House side of the Congress, would in my mind destroy the voice of America. And so I'm asking the question whether anybody in AFSA or State Department is available. Is the State Department engaged in supporting the voice of America on the Hill? Well, uh, I'm probably not really the right person to ask that question, to be honest. Um, I, I, uh, I believe so, but I don't know in what ways or how often or with whom and all those kinds of things, because frankly I'm not, I'm not in the room. Um, as I say, I think there's a, a strong interest in uh, and support for the concept of there needing to be an international broad, U.S. international media, U.S. broadcasting system, um, and certainly Mr. Stengel is taking his responsibilities very seriously, uh, and it's nice to have another former journalist to talk to about those things. Um, but we could always use more. We could use more support for, for the idea of the Voice of America. It's an incredibly strong uh, brand and, and identity, and it has an enormous impact. But most people, even quite sophisticated people on the Hill and in the State Department, just don't really understand what an enormously powerful thing they have. And they don't value it as well as they should, and they don't uh, help it to be effective in all the ways that they could, I will say that. Um, but I, I, I do think our relationship with the State Department is warming up. And I think there are some pretty smart people there who realize how valuable the relationship can be. Uh, Africa is the most obvious place, but I mean, we, we work very closely with the, with, the, with the United States there. And we save lives. And we, uh, not, in, 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 in dozens of different ways, having to do with diseases, having to do with uh, people on the run, not knowing where the safe camps are, where the water is. We make clear what U.S. policy is, we assure people. We are enormously useful uh, for the United States. At, we are a national security, we're, we're a journalistic organization that is also a national security agency. Um, it's, people might say that's complicated, but actually I don't think it is at all. Because one of the things that's in our Bill of Rights is freedom of speech. You know, th there's this discussion sometimes that I hear, uh, well, maybe you should become um, an advocate for everything about U.S. foreign policy. And I think the more sophisticated people in the State Department don't think that is the case. Because VOA is built on a bedrock, and, and that bedrock is the First Amendment of the United States, the Constitution. Freedom of speech. A confident nation put that into the charter for us in 1976. Uh, and it's a very, very strong thing. People respect us because we're honest about ourselves. 
Uh, and then they listen to us, and we have credibility when we talk about them and their issues. Um, so I think people in the State Department understand that, but I can always use more. Thank you for the question. Sir. Thank you for speaking today. I'm uh, Matthew Wallen, American Security Project. Um, speaking of national security, we've seen recently in the news uh, a few unfortunate incidents where U.S. journalists were murdered, essentially, in the line of their duties uh, overseas covering conflict areas. What types of considerations is Voice of America taking, both for the protection of its journalists and even possibly for the protection of some of its listeners? On the wall, in the front hall of the building, uh, at 4th and Independence Southwest are the photographs of journalists from Bo Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and some of our other organizations who have died uh, in the line of duty, if you will. Um, and it's, uh, I had the unfortunate obligation of putting one of those pictures up a year or two ago. One of our uh, service in, in, in West Pakistan, in the tribal areas, uh, one of our uh, stringers was shot point blank while uh, in a mosque worshiping. Um, and he was shot because he was the VOA reporter, and because he was a fearless reporter and told the truth about what was happening there. And some of the big bullies in the neighborhood didn't like that. Um, I guess the answer to your question is, like any other journalistic organization, we are very shocked by what has happened. We work hard to try to make sure our journalists don't take unnecessary risks. If anything, we have to usually restrain them because they tend to be eager to go where danger treads. And we have to sort of say, no, you can't go there, or we, don't, we won't accept your reporting from there if you go there. Things like that sometimes have to be said in order to try to minimize the, uh, the great dangers that are out there. You know, I, was, I mentioned I was a network television correspondent for 25 years. And I went south from here with signs on the car that said, periodista non dispari. People honored that back then. Now they shoot at it. It's a very different world that we're, we're, we're living in now for journalists in so many ways. But one of them is the, the respect of the profession is so low. And now you have groups like ISIS that seem to think uh, killing a journalist is good publicity for them. So we live in a pretty shocking world. We have to continue to report. We mustn't be intimidated by them. So you have to find a balance. And we're going to lose one once in a while. It's just the reality. And I think any, any leader of a large journalistic organization has to face that and be ready for it. And of course, take every step possible to minimize the danger. But you can't eliminate it and still report the news. And there's a lot of bad news in the world right now. So we have people in danger's way, but we are trying to be cautious about it. Sometimes we, we don't, and for example, I'm not going to name <coughs> names or countries. I know where they are, but I'm not. I try to make their work safer by not talking about it too much. But it's a constant daily concern. We have an executive editor who spends about, you know, probably a quarter of his time on this. Uh, perhaps one more question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you want to give it to Dan in the back? Another, another alumni of Voice of America? He's recently departed White House correspondent. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen, for making your comments. Um, I just have a couple, one observation and a question. So are you saying that U.S. taxpayers should support, and, and people in this room to whom you've directed a lot of attention, support VOA as a media company and a national security agency? Is it more of one or of the other equal? Also, on your point about antennas and transmitters being on rooms of embassies, given the security issues that we just uh, heard discussed, is that, is that a wise thing, <coughs> given the, the great risks and dangers abroad, not only to reporters, whether they're VOA or others, but to uh, um, U.S. staff? Is it, is it actually a good idea to have that, that kind of situation? Well, uh, it is for Voice of America. I don't want to speak for Voice of America uh, on the <coughs> latter question. I mean, it's, it's in our interest to have our transmitters and, and, and towers in, in the safest places we can find. Um, and in some cases, that is the U.S. Embassy. Um, as to whether that deter whether that hurts the security of the embassy, I, I, I wouldn't be the right person to to ask to respond to the question. But I think uh, 
I think the view has been that the, uh, the costs may out, the benefits may outweigh the costs. I, I don't know. I can't speak for, for the State Department. Uh, it probably depends on which embassy, which ambassador, and a few other questions. Um, as to what are we, uh, a, a national security agency or a journalistic organization, I, I just, I'll look you right in the eye and tell you we are both. And I'm totally comfortable with that, and I don't think it's hard to explain. Uh, because uh, we are, we're doing journalism, good journalism. You did some fine journalism uh, at, at working for us. Um, we're doing it. We're paid by the U.S. taxpayer. I mean, by the way, you know, so are some other organizations, but I won't, you know, go too far down that road for the moment. Um, it is in the United States interest for there to be a serious journalistic organization broadcasting in 45 languages, which, by the way, are chosen by the administration and Congress together. Um, you know, where they decide where we have a national security interest in. In, in broadcasting, but but it should be done by professional journalists using professional journalistic ethics, because that's one of the things that this country stands for. It's, it, it's the First Amendment of the Constitution, and it works. And when we and when we talked about the Abu Ghraib scandal, I wasn't at VOA at the time, but I understand our audiences went up quite sizably. <coughs> Foreigners were rather impressed with how honest we were about our own failings. Well. We try to be honest about everything. We know we're imperfect. Everybody is. No journalism is perfect. It's always a process. But the goals are good. And it sets an example to others that others aspire to. And talking through affiliates is wonderful. Latin America, that is so good at this now, they're on the morning calls, the editorial calls, with some of the biggest TV stations in the whole of Latin America. They're discussing, well, what are you going to cover today? And what's our role going to be? And they're just part of the conversation. That has a public diplomacy effect beyond what appears on the air for the United States. It's profound. We set standards. We, are, we become colleagues and friends of the journalists who are struggling in places like Venezuela and Ecuador and Peru to get good news broadcasting on the air. And it has an enormous impact beyond just what you see on the air each day that our actual reporter says. Although that, too, is profound. In uh, Mexico, uh, overnight, when we signed up Azteca TV, we suddenly had 6 million new viewers. And we have them every night, just for a few minutes, but it's primetime television. And we report about whatever they want us to report about, the immigration debate, the growth of growth and strength and influence of Hispanics in, in the United States, whatever they want. And in the process, they learn more about us, and we get to sort of impart, shall we say, what we stand for, who we are, uh, our people, our values, and so forth. So I'm very proud of what I do, and I'm, I'm very grateful to you for taking the time to listen to it. Um, this is an audience I know with a lot of people in it who do understand Please go out and cross the ties for us, because uh, there aren't enough people who do. And as I say, I'm going down to Florida and North Carolina in the next couple of days to try and do a little of that sort of thing myself. But thank you very much for your interest in the Voice of America. Well, let me be the first to express the thanks both for ASA and the Public Policy Council for a great presentation today. And we hope to see you some kind of time.